Thank you very much and good afternoon. Thank you, Jolene, for that beautiful speech. That was fantastic. And it's a good segue to our panel, which also has a lot to do with Indonesia. But first, I would like to thank you, the audience. You are a hearty crowd, which gives me a lot of hope. This is Saturday afternoon in New York City, and you've been here all day, so give yourselves a round of applause. Thank you for being here. We have our next panel focused on peatlands, which many of you might know, but you might not know that peatlands are found in 180 countries around the world. They only cover about 3% of the world's surface, but are responsible for 5% of all emissions. Potatoes farmed on former peatlands in the European Union are one of the EU's biggest and most easily stoppable sources of greenhouse gases. So peatlands are not just a topic for Indonesia and developing countries. But Indonesia has been on the forefront with other countries in the Global Peatlands Initiative of doing something about this problem. Today we will take a look at Indonesia, but we have also the two Congos and Peru in the Global Peatlands Initiative. More countries are joining. This is a initiative of about 30 organizations. And I would like to invite on the stage Park Agus Justitianto from Indonesia, from the Ministry of Environment and Forests, from FAO Mete Wilkie, where is Mete, my co-conspirator, to prepare the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. So Mete, myself, and a small team in UNEP and FAO are preparing this decade, but we both have day jobs too. So I'm moderating this panel because Peatlands is part of, of my team and of Meta's team in FAO. And Mr. Tsuyoshi Kato, Vice President of the Vana Subur Lestari Forestry Association in Japan, who's done some fascinating research on peatlands. So to kick us off, um, I would like to start with Pa Agus. Uh, please, if you can tell us a little bit about why Indonesia is taking this serious and what is the International Tropical Peatland Center. Pa Agus, you have the floor, please. Thank you, Tim. Uh, very good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, as you know, peatland are found in... Como saben, estas... Eh, tipo de tierras almacenan mucho carbón, el 30-40% de los depósitos de carbono. Estas turberas es uno de los mejores almacenamientos de carbono. Estas turberas son un ecosistema clave, juegan un papel importantísimo en mantener la diversidad, la biodiversidad, reducen las emisiones de gases de invernadero, pero eh, son un sistema también que mantiene a las comunidades que viven de esta tierra, tiene un alto potencial para mitigar el cambio climático. Estas turberas saludables pueden ser una fuente de alimentos, agua limpia y otros productos que benefician a las comunidades locales. Tienen una característica especial que hace que estas turberas sean sitios especiales para actividades educativas y culturales. Pese a la importancia de este tipo de tierras, son de los ecosistemas más vulnerables amenazados por estas actividades del hombre, actividades humanas. Están sometidos a la deforestación y a degradación debido a la, la demanda cada vez mayor de maderas y Esto es algo que va a afectar la calidad de los ecosistemas, incluyendo con una con pérdida de biodiversidad y un aumento de las emisiones de gases de invernadero. Esta degradación de las eh, turberas ha aumentado la cantidad de incendios forestales, aumentando la polución y amenazando la vida de estas áreas. Ahora han recibido una atención de aquellos que quieren mantener estos ecosistemas y detener su degradación. Pese a la concientización mayor sobre la importancia de estas turberas, hay 
falta de información como para entender completamente el papel que juegan las turbinas en la mitigación del cambio climático y el increíble potencial que tienen. Ya hemos visto eh, estos resultados en Indonesia. Sin embargo, existen faltas de conocimiento que podremos eh, mejorar únicamente a través de la cooperación. Tenemos que inspirar y lograr que se establezcan compromisos para impedir la degradación de estas turberas apoyando estos esfuerzos de conservación más recientes para aumentar el conocimiento de esas turberas se estableció un centro de tierras de turberas en Indonesia, esto lo veremos en el video Estas turberas tropicales juegan un papel muy importante, consumen, eh, usan el 3% del área, pero a, almacenan 30% del carbono global. Cuando se las drena y se las daña, emiten 2 gigatoneladas de CO2 o 6% del carbono a nivel mundial. Con el apoyo de Indonesia y otros asociados, esta organización aglutina científicos, comunidades, legisladores y otras partes interesadas. Este, el centro se inauguró en Yakarta el 30 de octubre del año pasado para cambiar el paradigma de investigación y desarrollo y para tomar mejores decisiones sobre el futuro de este tipo de bosques. El centro quiere diseminar información y desarrollar herramientas para ayudar en la conservación y el manejo o la gestión sostenible de estas turberas tropicales. Esto se adoptó en la resolución de las Naciones Unidas para instar a todos los actores a que participen en este esfuerzo. Esta adopción es algo realmente una ganancia para estas turberas. Bienvenidos al Centro Tropical de turberas. Se sí, quiere transformar en un centro de excelencia y de referencia para la gestión. Muchas gracias. Gracias por mantenerse dentro de los límites de tiempo. Para Indonesia en particular, este es un tema muy importante. También hoy en día hay incendios forestales, como han visto en los medios. De As we see in Brazil, even though they don't get as much media attention at the moment. Um, so the efforts that Indonesia is undertaking, not only on peatland management, but on early detection and early fighting of fires, are really critical for all of us. So I think they need our international support for that effort. But I would like to uh, move to Mete um, and the perspectives from FAO on peatlands. Please, Mete. Good afternoon. Uh, as Tim said, I'm from FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Uh, we are one of the <coughs> members of the Global Peatlands Initiative and providing support also to, to Indonesia. Um, I come from a country that also has peat in Denmark, uh, but let's just focus on the tropical peatlands for the time being. Uh, my very first job with FAO was in a similar ecosystem in the mangroves, uh, where there's a lot of peat too. Uh, but I'm here to tell you a little bit about what we do and what support we can provide to countries on peatlands. As we've heard, the degraded peatlands contribute at least 5% of the annual anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions. And this is based on an estimate that about 15% of all peatlands are degraded. But in an effort to better map the peatlands around the world, we hear back from our field crews that are out in the various countries, and it actually looks as if that figure is too low. It may be more than 15%. 
But we also have some good news. New peatlands have recently been discovered. But the lack of data on these ecosystems limit our understanding of the role that they can play in climate change mitigation, in adaptation, and in the water cycle. It also limits our understanding of the impact of the loss of peatlands on water provision, carbon storage, biodiversity, and most importantly, livelihoods. Yet, even without detailed knowledge, it's already clear that to reach not only the Paris Climate Agreement goals, but many of the other SDGs, we need to protect the existing peatlands and wetlands and restore those that have been degraded. That's why it's so important that we find out where they're located and what, what their health is to see how we can better manage and conserve them. So that's why we at FAO support countries in the monitoring of their peatlands. So we've developed a number of tools, including a platform allowing countries to analyze satellite imagery without the needs of coding skills or big computer power. So now anyone can go and access this platform called CEPAL and can look at, in some cases, daily images to help keep track of changes to peatlands as soon as they happen. So make sure that we have actions on the ground as soon as changes are beginning to emerge. Some of these are already being tested and tried in tropical peatlands in Indonesia and are contributing to the peatland restoration information and monitoring system and the soil moisture maps that also Indonesia have been piloting on this. We also have some tools that help access, uh, assess the carbon storage in the peatlands so that countries can help use that for their reporting for their NDCs. These available platforms and tools can help countries and the international community to understand the many and different important roles that peatlands play, despite their small area. With such holistic monitoring systems in place, providing this evidence, we have a better chance of persuading decision makers to develop adequate policies and to take action to protect and restore peatlands. Thank you. Thank you, and if, uh, also, uh, thank you, Mette, and if also our third speaker sticks to time, we might even have time for a question from the audience. Wouldn't that be revolutionary? Uh, so thank you, and uh, now I give the floor to, um, to Yoshi Kato. Please watch this young lady in the front. She will time you. Yes, uh, And I, I understand, understand we also have a video to go with your presentation. Please, the floor yeah. is yours. Thank you. Uh, my name is Kato. I'm honored to be able to speak uh, at this Global Landscape Forum in New York. We have been planting trees in West Kalimantan since 2010 in Indonesia to utilize degraded peatlands. Before we started, there, there, there was a lot of debate inside my company about engaging in peatlands. We recognize, recognize, however, that if we do nothing, that peatlands would be destroyed completely, and that in the worst in the worst case, this would contribute to the global climate change. Our most co important commitment was to protect the natural tropical peatlands forest as a company and to use degraded peatlands for sustainable timber, timber production business. Before starting the business, we began to make a detailed topographic map with a contour interval of 50 centimeters. And then, as you know, the boundaries of concessions set by the government do not match the edges of ecosystems. Therefore, th the scope of our survey was uh, expanded to outside our concessions in order to a uh, landscape level. Also, after through fauna and flora research, we decided on areas to be protected. To prevent the protected habitat, we also collaborating with uh, neighboring companies to build a conservation network. 
Although management at the landscape level is attracting attention worldwide, we are, we are proud that the, on, the grand, on, on the grand effort will be a rare case. Here is a video that introduced the peat management plan. Please. Pitland Management and Conservation in Practice by Wana Subur Lestari and Mayangkara Tanaman Industry. As the first management activity prior to our operation, the intensive grid survey gives us information about elevation point in our concession and provides a contour line assessment. Topographic mapping at the scale of detail is the key tool for water management. We have conducted a highly intensive field topographic survey at 50 meter intervals along the grid lines of more than 1,800 kilometer in order to produce a highly detailed and unique topographic map with 0.5 meter contour. We also conducted a survey about peat elevation and peat depth to soil substrate inside and about the adjacent protected forest where the pit dome is located. From those survey data, we develop a topographic map as a basic information in determining our area management types, including production, conservation, and social zones. In addition to that, we also specifically set an area to be used as a water reservoir to maintain the water supply for lower areas. The dark blue line is the concession of Wanasubur Lestari, while the light blue line is that of Mayangkara Tanaman Industry. To achieve a balance between tree production and ecosystem conservation, biodiversity is also managed. A comprehensive network has been established, including the core conservation area or protection forest and riparian zones to provide natural habitat and corridors for animals to move. Currently, together with the uh, Indonesian Mi Ministry of Environment and Forestry, we started a pilot project in 2017 to develop a peat management model. For our philosophy, there are three things. Simple, low cost, and easy to maintain. It's not because only one company needs to achieve proper peat management, but it's meaningless if there, uh, these technologies are not widely used by national, local, and governments. By implementing proper water management, we have maintained high groundwater levels at 20 to 40 centimeters across the landscape, including during the El Nino dry period in 2015. And as a result, there has been no peat fires in our planting area, including during uh, uh, current dry season. Well, today, I, w I want to tell you one more thing. Until now, tropical forests have been called the lungs of the planet. However, I realized that it has, been, it has an even more critical role in peatland ecosystems. The, the Amazon, Congo Basin, and Indonesia are the wettest areas in the world. Therefore, tropical forests and peatlands play a role in accumulating a large amount of rainwater that falls in the rainy season into the ground and releasing, releasing water into the atmosphere through evapotranspiration evaporant transpiration. In other words, the massive 
evapotranspiration from tropical forests and peatlands can play an important role in water circulation, with water circulation locally, continentally, and globally. As a result, the destruction of tropical peatlands may also lead to rainfall anomalies affecting agriculture activities and even food security. Supplying, supplying water to the four us is the same as sending blood to the, to the entire body. In other words, tropical forest and peatlands are the, the heart of the planet. Once it is destroyed, it will not return. We will need action as soon as possible. Finally, good news excited us in early this year. The orangutan, the orangutan mother and child was observed for the first time in a camera trap set up in a protected area in the concession. The fact that an orangutan baby was found in the, the fact that uh, an orangutan baby was found in the concession is, a, is evidence that the number of individuals has increased. I want to share it with you and finish my speech. Thank you. Ah, please show the... Thank you so much for sharing those insights from concession management in Indonesia and the biotic pump model that you described of the role of forests as rainmakers is something that is yet not fully understood scientifically, but it's becoming more and more evident that indeed tropical forests are more the, the hearts of our planet than the, the lungs. Most of the oxygen is actually produced by the ocean, not by the uh, rainforests, but uh, as we see in Brazil now more erratic rainfall patterns also in neighboring countries as the ecosystem is further degraded, there is evidence that forests produce rain. And I think with Mother Nature slapping us in the face now with climate change, one thing that we first have to learn is a new humility. There's so many things we don't understand about this planet, but one thing we do understand is if we mess too much with these systems, they will break down, and that will not be good news for anybody. So I was very impressed with the concession data that showed the fire maps, that on that concession, there were no fires. So keeping the water levels, keeping the water tables high is very important, and I really hope that the government, um, in enforcing the new peatland reg regulation that forces government, uh, that forces concessions to keep a water table high is, is fully enforced in Indonesia. So thank you again for sharing uh, those insights and thank you for our three panelists. And we actually now do have time for one or two questions if anybody has one. So ladies first, any lady who wants to ask a question? Not the case. Then I have two gentlemen, one over there. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. So am, am I allowed to make a comment that is not strictly related to pillands? Because I'm going to use this exceptional opportunity to, sa to, to say something I would like to tell some from the beginning. Is that okay? Uh, if you could keep it to one minute, that's fine. Yes. Oh, yes, okay, I, I can. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm David Moreno. I'm, I'm from Spain. I'm an restoration ecologist. And uh, we've been surveying um, 
uh, restoration uh, performance over the last 10 years. So we have been trying to understand how we, what we were getting with restoration, including pillance in our studies. And what we are finding is that over time, restored ecosystems improve, but I mean, restoration, it's, it's tricky. And the main two things that I'm missing here in this, in this meeting is um, one thing that was mentioned by, by, I think it was Ravi this morning, is ecosystem complexity. Another thing is time. So, and this opportunity that you are all talking about, the global restoration, I mean the global, the um, UN restoration decade is great, but restoration is more than planting trees, it's more than getting people involved, it's more than getting jobs, it's more than getting investments. It's, we first need to understand nature. So it's great we, we do all these amazing projects we are guys are talking because it's really, I mean, I really love it. But we need to be aware that if we're going to put all that money, all that resources, all those trees in one place, we need to understand how to do it. And what we've been finding is that we, too far, we are still at the very early stage of understanding how, what is restoration. So it would be great to get all those $800 billion that Ingrid was taking this morning about like, to invest in restoration and taking like 1% of that in first understanding what is restoration. Because what we are doing now, I. It's optimistic to tell that we are actually restoring things. We are learning on restoring things. And I urge everyone, so yeah, I'm finished. Thank <laughs> I'm you, finished. That, uh, that is a very relevant comment that we need to understand what restoration is. Please, very briefly. Very much. Uh, I had a question for Mr. Kaito. Uh, I applaud Sumitomo's work in taking the lead in creating a sustainable peatland forestry management program. Uh, could you tell us, are you working with the rest of your industry business uh, alliances to do similar so that there is greater leadership across all the forestry industry to do the work that you're doing and to extend it? Thank you. So the floor first to Mr. Kapla, two panelists, if you want to say a final remark. The question was, if you work with your fellow companies in yes. Indonesia, other yes. large concession holders, yes. to share your experience and yeah. ask them to do the same. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, we have, and, uh, we, we have implemented uh, a pilot project to make a model for sustainable uh, forestry in on peatlands together with the uh, Ministry of Environment and uh, Forestry. And then our results will be published and uh, published uh, as a scientific paper or some reports to share uh, other companies as well as uh, uh, local communities. And we we invited uh, from outside Indonesia, such as uh, Africa or South America, to transfer our technologies and to contribute to community uh, capacity development. Thank, Thank you. Mr. Pagagus. Yes, uh, I think the peatlands are part of the nature-based uh, climate solution. Uh, collaborative actions will be taken to promote best practices and innovation for conservation and sustainable management of peatlands, and to cope with the negative consequences of peatlands and sustainable management. Thank you, Mathieu. We've heard how small the area is, but how important it is, and we haven't had enough time to actually illustrate how important it is, both for livelihoods and biodiversity, in addition for the carbon cycle. I think what we would want to encourage that you take a look at the Global Peatlands Initiative, that you think about becoming a member there so that we can see how we can share experiences and information on how to restore, how to conserve the peatlands of the world. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, advertisement at the end. That's, of course, many of us are members of the Global Peatlands Initiative. If you want to join, contact either Matt or myself. We'll publish a new global assessment also next year that might include permafrost countries and, uh, sorry, permafrost 
um, and peatlands that are currently frozen but uh, might defrost. So that is another big issue where peatlands are of high interest to climate change and sustainable development. So I would like to thank uh, our panelists um, for their time and thank you for listening.